How's it going? Welcome to the Praxis Probiotics Thrive Together interview series. I'm joined today by a very special guest. My friend, activist, spoken word artist, workshop facilitator, author, and many other wonderful things, Sophie Sparrow. Yes. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so, I mean, um, we've, we've been chatting uh, well, before we've got the cameras rolling, we've been talking, there's loads for us to talk about, which yeah, is really, really good. Really exciting stuff, some really, really interesting, like, inspiring things that you've been spending your time doing. Um, today is November the 24th, I believe. Black yes. Friday, it's yeah. Friday, yeah, it's Black Friday. Um, the festive period is upon us, yeah? Yes, uh, yes so it is. <laughs> consumer hell looms. And it's an interesting time of the year for lots of different people for many different reasons. And you very kindly agreed to perform at our annual festive fair, mm -hmm. Padley Fundraiser and Alternative Market. It's something which you've been really supportive of over the years. You've performed on more than a handful of occasions there. So we're raising money for the Padley Group, who support homeless people as well as other vulnerable people in the city. So that's that's on December the 1st, so that's coming, up, that's coming up. So by the time that the people watch this, it will be at the weekend. It will be September the, uh, December the 1st. And also in the last sort of like 12 months, I mean, you've done various stuff for Padley in the past. So I'd just like to begin by asking you if it's okay um, about that. So the Padley group, yeah. your support for them. What are your thoughts and feelings? So, yeah, no, so I... I think it's really important um, for people to support homeless charities in general. What with the rise of austerity, um, the rise of like kind of cuts to people's you know services and what's available for people, and you know more and more people are becoming homeless and being put in difficult situations, and not people that the general public would imagine as homeless people, like, do you know what I mean? I think people have got this picture of the homeless when they kind of imagine them, and I don't think that's generally the case. I think anyone can become homeless with any circumstances, mm -hmm. and it's not for us to kind of be like, oh, so that's what a homeless person is, because that's that's a silly generalisation I think people have. So, yeah. and, you know, and so I, I like Padley because obviously it's, Derby's local kind of homeless charity, they do a lot of great stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I first kind of came to them, I did some kind of voluntary creative writing workshops um, with the Padley Centre, did a few craft sessions, you know, the guys are like making Christmas cards and stuff and mm -hmm. like that was fun. Um, and then decided that this year obviously they wanted the three charities that I wanted to raise money for. Um, but yeah, I just think like I just don't think the homeless situation is getting any, be getting any better mm -hmm. and I think it's just really important to try and do what we can um, just to support people that, that need help basically. Respect, yeah. okay yeah absolutely I think I mean I, I don't know the exact statistics but um, you know since sort of like austerity measures have been brought in mm. since sort of 2010 I think we're looking at at least some or around about like the homeless as homelessness has kind of tripled or something like this. And I guess we're not just talking about rough sleepers either, are we? I mean, if no. you walk through the city centre early in the morning, you get a bit of a snapshot of the scale of the problem because there's not a huge amount of ordinary workers and consumers that are just going about their business, but you do see a lot of bodies in shop doorways and things like that, and that, that picture would have appear to have got, got worsened. Mm. But it's homelessness isn't just about rough sleepers. It's about people that don't have permanent accommodation and people that are in vulnerable sort of housing situations and things like that. So it's from my point of view, it's like a a really it's it's crucially important. And I guess you've got like the weather. Yeah, this time of year, like it's so cold outside, and just the fact that like I met a guy um, last night that was sleeping in a tent with his partner under a bridge and he told me that the police had threatened had told him that he had to take his tent down so he wasn't allowed to have his tent there and I'm just thinking like but where else does he have to go you know mm -hmm. it's just absolutely terrible and and he was offered a place at a hostel but it was an all male hostel so he couldn't 
So it wasn't for him and his partner. They were right. split up, so he had to turn it down. Uh-huh. And he had to, and he decided not to take it because he didn't want to leave her as a woman um, to sleep rough at night. So obviously, like women have more things to consider um, when it comes to rough sleeping, especially on their own. So yeah, so you know, just speaking, and that was just last night. That's just one example of one person that I spoke to last night, and there's thousands of others. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and it feels to me as well like it's a time of the year where there's a lot of people that take this opportunity to try and like connect with their loved ones, like their friends and their families. And that seems to stand in stark contrast to me for the experience that others less fortunate might have at this time of the year. It's a real juxtaposition. You've got people that are walking down the streets, there's a huge amount of pressure on them to be rinsing out their credit cards, buying things for others that maybe aren't needed or whatever it might be, however you think about it, this time of the year. And um, and it's really, really difficult out there as well, as you've pointed out, you know what I mean? There, you know, there's people that are gonna be dying on the streets um, and because of the cold and, and, and the lack of kind of provisions and that sort of thing. I think it's wonderful that there are places like Padley that exist and there's various other services in, in Derby as well where they don't want to miss any out. I know there's like Nourish, I know there's like Doorways and, and I believe there's other, you know, groups, projects, charities, etc. that exist up and down the country, which I feel massive respect for. But mm-hmm. when you think about this time of the year, so like I said, it's Black Friday today, you've got the absurdity surrounding, you know, there's like discounts, deals, bargains galore, people are trampling over people to try and get their 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 cheap widescreen TVs or whatever it is. You know, I'm smiling, it's dark, it's 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 kind of like it's like it's a, tragically It's Black Mirror. <laughs> it's Black Mirror. Yeah. Like an actual Black Mirror T V episode is is happening outside today. So For real. I just try and avoid it. Uh-huh. <laughs> basically. So with that, so so this is kind of bringing me on to what I wanted to ask you really. Like when so also, I mean the thing about the festive fair, it's not just the festive fair. I do want to take the opportunity to kind of like plug it because we are raising money for the Padley and I'd love people to come along and help us do that because they're gonna be providing essential services over the festive period and you know throughout the whole year. Um, but it's also an opportunity for people that don't want to necessarily chuck their money at the corporation to come along and support more ethical, sustainable, local artisans, producers, authors, etc. Um, when you think about this time of the year for yourself, what does it kind of mean to you? How do you roll? I'm not, I'm not big into the whole consumer Christmas thing. Like I've never really been, you know, I've, I'm, I'm, first of all, I've not got barrels of money to spend uh-huh. on stuff. Um, but it's, I don't know, it's a time of the year that I suppose I used to be like really anti-Christmas. I used to be like a proper Scrooge and I used to be like, oh, I hate Christmas, blah. And uh, now what I try and do is I think, yeah, well, I hated Christmas because I was trying to live the expected Christmas and do what people expected me to do and yeah. do what was kind of what society expected me to do. So now I just um, mm. just try and use it as an excuse to see people that I love and I'm not mm. seeing for a long time. Like um, one of my oldest friends, Shah, um, she lives in Portsmouth now. She's a, a doctor doing a PhD down there and she only comes up here like, you know, like a few times a year. So it's just a good excuse to see her and mm-hmm. so I just try to kind of tailor it I just think about it as if nothing else just spending the day with people that you know like people like I'm lucky to have a really nice lovely little family and just to go and see them so I just yeah so going moving away from the presence and consumer side of it I just try and spend it with people that you know I like basically <laughs> beautiful, beautiful I feel like there's a, a bit of a shift going on as well I've, 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 one thing that I've noticed there's lots of wonderful events that are occurring mm-hmm. I know that DRS Dobbs Refugee Solidarity which I want to give a big shout out to I want to big them up and promote what they're doing they're doing an event you can find it on Facebook or type it in Google on the same day as the festive fair <clears throat> that's happening I think it's from the morning until about three o'clock and um, so they're going to be raising money for Derbyshire Refugee Solidarity who do wonderful work to help support refugees and then a week later there's also Compassionate Derby. Yeah, yeah, no totally. So I um, I'm a someone that I work part-time um, at Soundbite so I'm a 
classed as a casual member mm -hmm. of uh, Derby's vegan co-op known as Soundbites, if people don't know mm -hmm. um, about Soundbites and they're great and all of the products that they have are ethically sourced and they're all vegan and they've got some really tasty chocolatey treat things which I love and uh -huh. I love selling and so they um, every year they host like Compassionate Derby which is basically a big vegan wonderful fair I suppose and it's got all different stalls like in you know, they've got charities there, like people like Sea Shepherd normally come down and represent, and um, there's loads of food there as well, which is good. So, vegan food is nice. Respect. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, like nice it. one. I mean, and again, I, you know, I don't want to tell people what to do, but it's just providing information so that people have got informed, so people can make informed choices. You know, a lot of people that aren't into the mass consumerism thing, they're mindful of, you know, a lot of the problems surrounding consumerism, whether it's like sweatshop labour or the, the destruction that's um, affected, to the, the, the destructive effects on the environment. There's many, many different sort of like problems surrounding like mass consumerism and that kind of thing. For many people, however, they would still like to be able to procure a few gifts for their loved ones. Yeah. And if you're somebody who would like to do that, then these are kind of like perfect opportunities to do that kind of thing. So yeah, totally. Compassionate Dog has been, I think this might be the eighth year, yeah. and, and like I said, there's like hundreds of stalls and it's, all for a good cause, so rather than contributing to the problem, it's an opportunity to contribute to some of the solutions that are out there. Exactly, and it, you know, and, and it's good that we have these places that we can go and buy things that are ethical, and people go, oh yeah, but you know, they, if I got, if I got it from, I don't know, Tiger, other high street brands are available to buy things from, um, they might be like, oh, it'd be cheaper, and I could save money and, and whatever, but. For me, it's kind of, it, it's not about that. It's about like getting something that you know the money's gonna go towards an ethical company. Uh -huh. And that's really important. And if people are worried about, you know, things being a little bit dearer, something you can always do is like, have a look around charity shops, mm. or make things mm -hmm. like, bake people cakes. People love cakes, mm -hmm. cakes are great. Or, or, you know, or treats or things like that. Or what I like to do now, is instead of um, you know get people gifts and, and things like that I try and think of things that I can do with them instead so mm -hmm. like almost be like well why don't we go and and do this in a day why don't why, why don't that be like our, our, our kind of present for each other you know spend time with people as opposed to giving them something physical beautiful yeah and I guess yeah memories man and experiences and I guess one thing that I'm thinking about quite a bit at the moment, um, as I've been like uh, kind of looking into sort of addiction and mental health issues surrounding depression and things like that, it seems like there's a lot of loneliness. There's a lot of people that feel isolated at this time of the year. And this idea of kind of like taking the time out to actually kind of like reconnect with people and make an effort to actually spend time with each other, which doesn't cost any money. It's like, you know, a way of kind of like, just building your bonds with friends or reconnecting or catching up and just providing that level of company and love mm. which for a lot of people is is you know it's lacking for a lot of people I think it's important I think if people like if you know that your next door neighbor like lives on their own and they don't you know and or they might be elderly and they might have their partner might have died or if you can like, think of someone that, that you know might be by themselves like at this time of year or doesn't want to go see family due to whatever circumstances then just give them a text or a call or something and just be like do you want to hang out or go get a coffee or you know something like that and although it's small in that it, it, I think those are things that make a real difference because uh, like you say like loneliness is a, a big big thing and a lot of people really struggle with this time of year because they're just constantly seeing adverts about you know big family dinners mm -hmm. or all this sort of stuff that they should be doing and for someone that doesn't have that it can be really isolating absolutely so, absolutely yeah. and it does feel like we are bombarded by advertisements which almost like present an unattainable reality for a lot of people i mean yeah. you know a lot of the advertisements you get this time of the year they're, they're, they're really clever and quite manipulative they're good at kind of like tapping into kind of like you know deep desires that people have for family and friendship and community and like warmth and security and all of these things but it's not necessarily reflective 
of the lived experience that people actually have in their communities. And just by being in, engaging with those and being bombarded by, the, by those ideas, it can actually make people feel as though they're doing something wrong or it's something that is like a great lack, almost like it's like a cruel reminder actually of something which doesn't, that isn't there for everybody, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think that these ideas are really, really important. I think it, personally, I think it's like a really important time of the year to actually kind of really think about what, what else is possible and how can we make it kind of like more meaningful yeah, totally. Yeah. So, and this is why I don't have a TV. Because uh -huh. <laughs> I can't cope. I can't cope with it. Just got all my Star Trek DVDs, and I'm fine. I'm fine with that. <laughs> sorted. Sorted. It, and what, what, I guess this thing as well. It just uh, makes me want to ask you about. Um, I was listening to a piece that you wrote this morning. You wrote it uh, very kindly for an album that I brought out a few years back called "The Road Less Travelled," called "The Gathering." Yeah. that you wrote yeah and I was listening to that and it seems like a, a theme that has run through quite a few of your pieces I really I've said to you earlier I really like the way that with your in your writing with your spoken word um, you have a real ability to kind of make the the, the political very personal and it, and for me and please you know feel free to correct me at any time but there's like a celebration of, of the importance of like community at times mm -hmm. in the gathering it was all, it felt like it was almost like a bit of an ode or like a bit of a manifesto to like the outcasts and the misfits and the rejected and the oppressed and the discriminated against and things like that. You know, it was kind of almost like a um, like a celebration of of the people in all of their glory, in all of the, in all of our forms. You know what I mean? In all, all of our uniqueness and diversity. Would you be willing to say a little bit about, uh, you know, some of, when it comes to when your writing mm. and like, who's it for? Like all the weird people. No, <laughs> no. It's so I try. Yeah, I suppose with my work, yeah, right. So like, I try and take big political issues or things that I think, you know, whether that be dealing with talking about stuff of homelessness or whether that be talking about like kind of feminism or women's issues or whether that be talking about like LGBT plus experiences with people and I try and make it in you know personalize it or make it into someone's story or tell it from so you're not dealing with this big topic you're looking at it from a, an angle or you're looking at it from like you know kind of one or two people's perspective, you know, but it says something about the wider world mm -hmm. from that. Yeah. I mean, I say that, I write all sorts of, of different things, but yeah, with, with the gathering, that was, it's just about, I just wanted to write something for people that, and I'm kind of, I like to do it at the start of my set, mm -hmm. um, if I've got like a nice load of time to do a nice kind of featured set, because um, it's kind of like a call to all the people that don't feel like they fit in mm -hmm. in society. So, you know, I think it starts with, oh, come all you faithless, joyless, and you defeated, um, which is, you know, a play on the on the, the, the song, oh, oh, come all you faithful, uh -huh. sort of thing. And I, I just wanted it to be, yeah, for people that feel like, you know, they don't fit in, or, or they feel weird, or they've been a loser, or they're either like a, you know, a homeless population, or they where, whatever they're from, and just be like, no, this is our space, and we're going to share it, and it just kind of to lift them up. Mm -hmm. Like, although I deal with like a lot of dark stuff and and that with my writing, something that I really think it's important to leave an audience with is hope. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Be that for you know, like for something that they can aim towards, or just just try and fill them with something and be like, look, I know all this stuff's happening, mm -hmm. but we can still there's still hope, and you've got to hold on to that, and that's what I try and leave people with with every set. So. Mm -hmm. um, beautiful and we're living in some very challenging times and you know there's there's a lot of awareness out there of regarding you know there's a mass myriad of sort of different problems that exist in society you know some perspectives would suggest that we're living in times of quite serious crisis and it's really really understandable that when people start to kind of like engage with the world around them that people can feel um, like deflated or disheartened or you know, traumatized by the scale of some of the problems that exist. So for me, this, this, the importance of hope, uh, a, a kind of like a a, a concrete, informed, um, 
sense of possibility, like what's actually possible, not, not, I and mean, this is me speaking obviously, but not like a blind faith, not like a kind of, um, nothing delusional, but something which is actually true, like there is always, from my point of view, there is always cause for hope, and I think that to be able to kind of like, inspire that in people is such an important thing. Um, yeah, well, well, I hope I do that. <laughs> I don't know. I hope so. Mm. Um, but yeah, when, I mean, when I started like writing, mm. it was various different influences. But one of my influences was um, a band called Crass mm -hmm. from the seventies. I was a massive fan of Crass, mm -hmm. and I loved the you know the fact that they almost would write like manifestos and they would write work and. And I and I suppose I started off as quite an angry writer. I was just responding to kind of what was around me at mm -hmm. the time, and I was like, "Well, I can see this, you know. I I can see this kind of deprivation over here. I want to write about that." Like you know, a lot of from working as a journalist, I saw a lot of people that I know um, die in mm. in Derby, and mm. and finding out through like various amount of different ways or. And just my experience and what was going on with my friends and seeing them struggling. So I started writing stuff, but then I thought, I don't just want to write stuff that's, you know, that's just like, ah, oh, this is awful. Because I'm like, this is great and it's a great outpouring for me, but it's not actually, it's not, I want to inspire people to do something, you mm. know, just something small. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be massive. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you don't have to go away and be like a A-lister and all that sort of stuff and inspire for that. Not, not that most people probably want to, I don't know, whatever. Anyway, uh -huh. I'm going off to topic. But oh, yeah. the point is uh -huh. that I want just to try and encourage small changes in mm -hmm. communities and just making people think like, oh, okay, there is something that, you know, I can, I can do, or well, there's something that I feel like I can live for, or there's something that, you know, that change can happen if I just, yeah. So that's, that's, so that, that's what I want to do, essentially. Beautiful, brilliant. Um, so we okay. So we were chatting earlier about yeah. uh, it's almost been a year since you released, uh, since you launched Mind the Gap. Yes. Okay. Would yes. you want to tell us a little bit about Mind the Gap? Yeah. And just how the year's been? Yeah, sure. If that's not too no, no, that's fine. Please do. That's great. So yeah, so please Mind the Gap was my first spoken word collection, um, which we launched in December last year. Wow, that was a long time ago. Well, um, in London. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, so we, you know, we had a launch in London. It was great. Um, I was really lucky that um, Benjamin F and I did the forewords mm -hmm. um, for the book, which was really awesome. And he's a great guy and a That's massive. A big deal. Yeah, and he's, you know, he's a massive um, inspiration for me as well. Really inspiring poet and just generally inspiring man in general. Mm -hmm. Um, so yes, that was good and it was fun. It was a great night. We had you know bands on and poets on and yeah, it was it was really good. Um, and then since then, I've just been doing a lot of gigging. So I've been going around, um, you know, doing different nights around the UK. Just trying to think of some of the top of my head. Manchester. I was up in Newcastle this week. Mm -hmm. um, even been to places like Leamington Spa. So there you go. <laughs> Flying. Living it big. Morning. Um, yeah, Coventry, going all around, just gigging. Uh -huh. um, it's been really fun. Did a week at the Edinburgh Fringe uh, with Please Mark the Gap. That was great. Really enjoyed that. Um, just, you know, put on a free fringe show. And that was cool. Um, and yeah, but this, this year has been, it's, it's been a mad year, Jones. Like, if you can think about how many things, I think I, I was like, how many things can I cram into one year? Uh -huh. So, yeah, so last August, um, I stopped drinking. Okay. Um, for my birthday, I gave myself sobriety. That was my present to myself. Um, and, I, and I planned to not drink for a year. Mm -hmm. And I kind of thought, right, okay, what, what can I do? And so me and another lady from Derby called Laura Mitchell mm -hmm. got together and we decided that, because she's my running partner anyway, mm -hmm. um, yeah, took up running. That's something I did um, in my sobriety. Um, and we decided that we wanted to raise some money for three local charities. So we chose um, the Derby Women's Centre, we chose uh, the local branch of Samaritans, mm -hmm. and we chose the Padley Centre. So we wanted it to be for three local charities that were kind of either struggling with funding or and just you know give something back to them. And we thought, okay, three charities, so we'll set 
three challenges. So we planned a half marathon, um, we planned a full marathon in Berlin, and then we also formed a female Bruce Springsteen tribute band <laughs> and put a gig on at the dog. So quite different, that wow. last one, but yeah, so that's taken up the majority of my year, <laughs> basically. So <laughs> these are no small feats either, right? And, uh, <laughs> no. you know, <clears throat> so I mean, for people to kind of like embark upon a year and think, right, I want to have a little think about some goals that I might set myself that I feel like are attainable and achievable. So setting up a, a Bruce Springsteen sort of like tribute-esque sort of band, <laughs> yeah. obviously as a seasoned singer. Yeah, never sung before. <laughs> so, right, so never like, sung before. You'd never ever sung before. No, start and singing. So you, so you decided it was going to learn like a couple of songs yes. as a singer. Yeah, so we, I chose 10 songs. <laughs> so, 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 right, we're going to do 10 songs. And you give yourself 12 months, obviously, to the... Well, I had eight months. Yeah, okay, right, okay. <laughs> we start in January. Okay. So kind of the decision was made around January. Right, right. So right. we're going to put in this gig. And so I decided, um, yeah, I thought, oh, let's get some singing lessons then. So I went to my, who's my, still my singing teacher now, which is awesome, um, Sarah Jazz, mm -hmm. and I says, uh, and you know, I knew her not well, and we become good friends now. And I was like, so she was like, what, what can I help you with? And I said, um, I would, uh, I'd like, I need to sing these ten Bruce Springsteen songs in this kind of female Bruce Springsteen tribute band I formed in eight months. She went, have you sung before? I said, no, I can't sing. She was like, right, okay, cool. So that was fun. Respect. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna find out more, right? We're gonna wrap up this part one now, okay. right? Join us in part two, and we're going to be speaking a lot more about the year that passed. We're going to be finding out how that all went. <laughs> we're going to be learning about how your marathons went, and talking generally, more generally, about the various different wonderful and inspiring things that you've been doing over the last year, as well as your intentions for the year ahead. Sophie Sparrow, thank you very much for joining us. Thrive together. <laughs>